If you're a North Korea news aficionado like me, you probably came across the NK News website well before discovering the podcast. It's an incredible source that gets you behind the headlines to give you what's probably the most reliable and evidence-based news on North Korea. Every business day, you'll get between 5 to 10 articles that provide exclusive news, detailed analysis, and informed opinions. And guess what? Each week, they send you forward-looking week-ahead briefings and news alerts to keep you ahead of the curve. There's more. NK News members also get special reader-only benefits, access to exclusive events and online conferences, and perpetual access to our archive of podcasts. And here's the best part. You can get a $100 discount on your annual subscription with the code PODCAST. Redeem this podcast-only special today by visiting nknews.org slash discount. That's nknews.org slash discount. Right, and welcome to the NK News podcast. I'm here in the NK News studio on Tuesday, the 18th of July with James Fretwell. James, welcome on the show. Thank you very much for having me. We were going to have Arias Dare, our former managing editor uh, by Zoom, but we had to get you in because you've written the biggest story of the last week. And what's interesting is, I mean, you're a, a historian by training. This is a history story rather than a news one, but it's a, very much got a news hook. Uh, but congratulations on reaching, what is that, 100,000 views? That's amazing. It's just short of 100,000 at the moment. But uh, yeah, hopefully it will tip over that. And that's really good for uh, for our websites. When you wrote it, did you have any idea that it would be this popular? No, I thought it was an interesting story. And uh, I've done a couple of history articles before that have done reasonably well, especially yeah. if you link them to current events, anything to do with, with Ukraine, especially, right. does very well these days for obvious reasons. But no, not not quite like this. I think this is uh, definitely the, the most read article I've published. So I'm really pleased with that. Great. Well, let's not leave our listeners on tenterhooks for too long. So this is about, uh, well, the hook is last week, Kim Yo-jong made some statements about American planes flying into North Korea's economic, exclusive economic zone, uh, that, that they would be shot down is basically her, the warning that she gave. And we, we talked about that on last week's podcast. So it's a very much a, a topic in front of mind. And then you've linked that back to a historical incident. So what was it? What happened? Right. So on April the 15th, 1969, uh, North Korea actually did shoot down an American recon plane. North Korean state media actually alluded to this incident when it was warning about US planes flying. Ah, and, it's easy and that's what tipped week. you off? Uh, or did you well, already know about the shooting down in 1969? Not tipped me off, but I, you know, it's it's interesting that North Korea is bringing this up. You know, it, it, we you get a lot of statements by North Korean state media warning about, you know, we're going to turn Seoul into a sea of flames or strike the U.S. or whatever. And I think uh, a lot of the a lot of the time, international audiences read those things or hear those things and kind of roll our eyes and mm. just think it's North Korea being North Korea. But actually, in this case, you know, as North Korean state media pointed out, this did actually happen. A, a North Korean plane opened fire on a U.S. recon plane in 1969, and it killed 31 Americans and uh, sparked a big crisis in Washington in the Nixon administration on, on how to react to this. I'm going to guess that's probably the biggest well, death of, of U.S. servicemen after the armistice was signed in 1953. I don't expect you to have memorized that, but do you happen to know? I think it is, yeah. 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 A year earlier, actually, the North Korea did kill another American during the seizure of the, uh, the USS, USS Pueblo. Pueblo. Right. I mean, 68-69 was the period that some called the mini-Korean War or the Second Korean War or the DMZ War. So it certainly uh, a lot of things happened then. There were... Uh, ambushes, there were incidents at Panmunjom, uh, there was the siege of the USS Pueblo, there was the Attempted. attack on the Blue House, yep. the North Korean commando. So this is in that context, right? Right, yeah. Or, or was there a long period of uh, of nothing and then this suddenly happened? Oh no, there were, there were tensions, there were a lot of incidents going along um, the military demarcation line, yep. uh, the border between the two Koreas during the 1960s. Yeah, it's difficult to kind of cast our mind back to that time because right. uh, inter-Korean incidents where there are actual casualties, they do happen every now and then mm -hmm. in, in the modern day. And we should be 
wary of that repeating. But at the time, yeah, tensions between the the two careers were very high and there were often uh, casualties involved. Now, where was this? But what, sorry, what kind of plane was this? You said it was a surveillance plane. Uh, do, do you know the model? And where was it? In t- I'm trying to find a reference point to what we were talking about last week, right? That sort of 200 kilometers out from the coast. Yes, yeah, so similar-ish kind of location. I think the American EC-121 reconnaissance plane was a bit closer to the uh, Soviet Union. But nevertheless, similar kind of thing going on. North Korea claims this exclusive economic zone like many countries do. But unlike many other countries, North Korea also says you can't fly in the airspace above our EZ. What does international law say about that, like the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, for example? So I think it's it's a little bit uh, unclear, but it doesn't... um, back up what North Korea is is saying. North Korea is asserting very strongly that no, you can't right. come into our air zone and international law doesn't. Certainly 200 kilometers seems a bit far. I don't think right. I mean, if, that, if that rule were applied with every country, there'd be a lot more shootings down, I think. Right, exactly. And so the US uh, has never recognized this. It didn't recognize this in 1969. It, didn't, uh, it doesn't recognize it today. Yeah. Now, back then, of course, uh, President Nixon was in the White House and he had as his national security advisor the now 100-year-old Henry Kissinger. What was, well, how did the U.S. react and what was being discussed at the time? Well, initially, it was quite an an embarrassing incident. It became known as the Flying Pueblo Mm. um, because of those comparisons to the kidnapping of the U.S. ship a year earlier. Similar kind of parallels. North Korea, this, this tiny little country has just committed this great provocation against the uh, you know the mighty americans and yet just as the johnson administration you know deciding how can we react against this is obviously tensions flaring how could, should we you know strike one sam port or something mm. but in the end uh, the johnson administration in in 68 with the pueblo ops to go for the diplomatic route and nixon was kind of critical of how the Johnson administration reacted to this. Ah. Um, so when his own flying Pueblo incident occurs, you know, right. eyes are on him. How is Nixon going to react? Right, there's a bit of uh, pressure on on him to up the ante, so to speak, to go a bit further than the Johnson administration did. Right, exactly. So you know, Nixon and his top advisors are discussing um, how to, how can we react to this. And um, and this is in the middle of the Vietnam War, of course, sixty nine. So it's uh, right. It's, yeah, it, it's a busy time in terms of American foreign uh, policy and security and, and military well uh, activity outside the United States. Indeed, yes. So they're they're discussing how can we react to this, and they come to the same conclusion that actually many U.S. administrations come to mm. in later decades, which is that if you hit North Korea back, there's the risk that there's going to be this continuous tit for tat that keeps escalating and keeps escalating and could involve more American casualties. So in the end, they kind of, in some ways, you could dis- say that they decided to do nothing in retaliation. Um, but there were some plans drawn up, weren't there, involving oh, yes. nuclear weapons. So give us the, yeah. uh, the scoop on that. Well, yeah, as you said, yeah, they, they didn't decide re- to react initially because of this fear of escalation. But it did prompt the Nixon administration to really consider how are we going to react if North Korea conducts future attacks. And it came up with a whole list of of contingency plans. And one of the most striking options that was reiterated to the Nixon administration was uh, Operation Freedom Drop. This was also uh, the Johnson administration had been discussing an operation by a similar name during the Pueblo crisis. Mm. But yeah, according to now declassified documents, the Nixon administration, when it was discussing this freedom drop operation, it contained a number of nuclear options to respond to a North Korean provocation. One of these would be to drop 10 to 70 kiloton nuclear bombs on North Korean airfields. On Um, airfields. Okay, just as context, what's the size of, uh, say, the nuclear bombs that were dropped on uh, Hiroshima and or Nagasaki in in August? So those were about um, uh, 15 to 20 kilotons. Okay, so it's in a similar range. 
Uh, well, 70, up to 70 kilotons. Yeah, up to 70, yeah. but it's not like... Because yeah. I think by then, by 69, they already had some that were over 100 kilotons. They, did they have they reach the megaton? Well... The megaton yeah, phase may have come huge, later, but yeah. they were getting up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they were much bigger nuclear weapons. But, of course, we all know the history of the... Uh, you know, the massive casualties that yep. the Hiroshima and Nagasaki sure. nuclear bombs caused. So even if we're going to say these are small nuclear right. bombs, they're still uh, devastating weapons. But remarkably... I, yeah, go on. In your, in your mm. story, you do say that the, uh, the, the list of expected kills was quite low, wasn't it? Yeah, it was only going to be around, you know, a couple of hundred to maybe several thousand civilian casualties. Mm. Those were the estimates. But the idea behind this anyway, that dropping these nuclear bombs on North Korean airfields was... Was there a number given? Or uh, a number of airfields? 16 airfields. 16 airfields. Okay, so that's a heck of a lot of... Mm -hmm. Certainly a lot more than we're used to end World War II. Yeah. It's very extreme, you know. I mean, Mm. compare it to today. If today 31 US service men and women were shot down on a plane, Mm. the, the political pressure to react would also be immense, I imagine. It would be hard to imagine any White House administration simply moving on and saying, well, we can't because of the risk of retaliation. But still, moving from there to 16 nuclear bombs is is in a very extreme step. Right. So this wasn't necessarily in reaction to another recon plane shoot down. It was um, sort of, you know, the the incident itself kind of prompts the Nixon administration to consider all possibilities. And so this plan to drop nuclear, nuclear bombs on North Korean airfields, this would have been in response to a North Korean air attack on South Korea, for example. Ah. But anyway, the, the, the logic behind Freedom Drop yeah. or other contingency plans that involve just massive US military strikes on North Korea, the Nixon administration had kind of come to the conclusion that, yeah, okay, we don't really want to have this risk, this tit for tat, where, yeah. okay, um, North Korea shoots down a plane and 31 Americans die. So, Maybe we uh, attack a North Korean air base and mm-hmm. 50 North Koreans die. So Kim Il-sung says, okay, we'll attack somewhere in South Korea and 100 die. And, you know, it keeps on going up and going up. The idea was that, okay, if we're going to attack North Korea, we need to go big or go home. Mm-hmm. We need to absolutely obliterate their ability to retaliate against the US and South Korea. Yes, I recall there was a uh, a quote from uh, Henry Kissinger. I'm going to see if I can scroll down and find it because I read it last night uh, in a fake <laughs> Kissinger accent. If the object is to prevent countermeasures, the action taken should be a powerful blow. Indeed, that, yes. That I'm getting it wrong. I'm, ha- I'm, making, <laughs> I'm making him sound much too Russian. I apologize, uh, Dr. Kissinger, if you're listening um, for that one. But still, now, as a historian, here's a question for you. Mm-hmm. I've heard it said by a few different people that, historically speaking, when North Korea does something like shoots down a, a plane or, uh, or shoots a, a rock, sinks a rock ship or fires a, at an island, when there's a threat of some escalatory retaliation, North Korea generally tends to back down at that point. And a good example of that is um, just six, seven years after the shooting down of the plane, there was the, the murder at the Panmunjom of two U.S. officers who were beaten to death with axes. And that then started Operation Paul Bunyan, where the Americans you know, pulled everything out and you had uh, airplanes and, and a strike fleet and, and every man basically on the peninsula sitting on a helmet and, and waiting to go to battle. So, mm-hmm. uh, But when they went in to chop that tree down, uh, there wasn't a North Korean in sight. So right. the, generally the tendency of North Korea is do something and then retreat and, and you know, hope it'll blow over. Is that more or less your take on the situation? I would say that according to declassified documents, Well, uh, Soviet documents, actually. So you can find them on the Wilson uh, Center website and its discussions between Soviet diplomats and uh, North Korean officials. Mm. And the North Korean officials are very uh, aggressive when Mm. explaining the situation to the Soviet official. Uh, You know, they maintain that we've warned the Americans and that uh, they're just getting what they deserve. And if you intrude into our sovereign territory then we're going to shoot you down they don't seem to be uh very apologetic or um looking like they're going to back down but having said that of course there isn't another shoot down incident right that was um, 54 years ago yeah. we haven't had one of course you do make a reference to bobby and i've forgotten his last name and his co-pilot who were mm-hmm. shot down uh in a helicopter that did actually fly over the military demarcation line into you know, yeah. n- northern territory that was 94 94 yeah 
And yeah, so that's a very different case. Yeah. But yeah, maybe it's difficult to know because North Korea, you know, we have access to declassified American documents and some declassified Russian documents. Uh, not many declassified North Korean documents. No, that's true. That's right. We, we, <laughs> um, we, can only get, we can only hope to get these kind of conversations with other countries, right? Like Russian, exactly, Soviet yeah. diplomats or East German, yeah. or R- Romanian diplomats yeah. and get them out of there. Well, that's, as you say, like some of our best sources from that period are yeah. actually, um, yeah, discussions with former communist bloc mm. uh, diplomats that have now been released. It is important to note as well that in response to this crisis, you know, Nixon, when we think about uh, his policy toward the Korean Peninsula, we actually often think about troop withdrawals. Right. I think, yeah, in 90, so in uh, 1969, actually, shortly after this incident, he delivers uh, the Nixon Doctrine, which is broadly speaking, it's about Asian countries are now going to assume more of the security burden for their own protection. America's going to Ah. draw down direct troop assistance. This was, you know, obviously the Vietnam War, there's a big context in that, but it also applies to right. South Korea and under the Nixon administration, troop numbers in South Korea, US troop numbers decreased from mm-hmm. 55,000 to 40,000. That's um, a big, big drawdown. It is a huge 15, drawdown. 15,000, yeah. yeah. And uh, this was the 7th Infantry Division, I believe. So, but in reaction to this, um, it did deploy uh, three aircraft carriers to the region, wow. carrying a lot of fighter planes. And this was meant to be uh, kind of sent as a warning to North Korea yeah. to show that, you know, in the in the immediate days after that, mm-hmm. if North Korea did ch- try to shoot down another American plane, then, you know, the US might have the assets in the region to react more quickly yep. to that. As um, they did with, with Operation Paul Bunyan. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's 54 years now. We haven't had a plane shot down, but, but last week suddenly Kim Yo-jong made this very... Uh, aggressive statement that planes will be shot down even if they're over the mm-hmm. uh, the sea, the East Sea or the Sea of Japan between Korea and Japan. It's, uh, it's a long way out there. And whatever UNCLOS says on that, it, basically it's up to North Korea to police that, to uh, to enforce that. You know, if, if it's going to make these mm-hmm. warnings, then it's up to North Korea to enforce and make sure that those planes don't get into that area. Um, why do you think this, this story of yours created such a big a big buzz that went so almost viral, shall we say? Well, I think it's pretty shocking to hear about American plans for nuclear war. You know, whenever nuclear weapons are involved, we haven't had nuclear weapons use since 1945. So it's quite scary to read about yep. um, these plans being drawn up years later and realize that, oh, the US is always thinking, not necessarily that they're going to use them tomorrow, but at least always planning. Mm-hmm or what situations it might have to use its nuclear weapons in, you know, and of course, as we're sitting here recording this now, and as listeners are listening to the podcast, I'm sure the US is also considering when it might need to use these weapons uh, around the world now, and we'll, we'll find out about those plans in many years later. I think that's one reason. Another reason is because we keep hearing almost every other week now, North Korea is launching a long-range missile, yep. and there's talk about nuclear tests and tensions rising on the peninsula. But actually, well, nothing has actually happened, I suppose. You mm. know, we haven't heard of any attacks on South Korea or anything like that. And I think this incident just reminds that, sure, we can we can go through these long processes of North Korea launches a missile, says something about destroying the US, US denounces it, and then nothing really, well, nothing, nothing really happens. Mm. Um, But this incident does remind that things can and possibly could happen on the peninsula in the near future. It's a good and sobering reminder. Let's hope that nothing happens uh, while we're here and, uh, and into the future. Attention, North Korea portfolio professionals. Are you in need of more than just sloppy and spotty South Korean news coverage on the DPRK? If so, I present to you NK Pro. Born from the established news gathering reputation of NK News, NK Pro leverages staff experience and top notch technology to provide subscribers with superior knowledge and tools to achieve their goals. Expect daily analysis, exclusive tools, and a suite of research tools that cover everything from North Korean state media to the whereabouts of DPRK vessels and aircraft. How cool is that? 
In a world where the landscape of North Korea seems unknowable to many, NK Pro cuts through the noise and provides you with the quality, reliability and timeliness you need. Stay ahead, stay informed and master the landscape with NK Pro. Trust me, it's a game changer. Interested? Visit nknews.org slash professionals to claim your free 30-day trial of NK Pro. Once again, that's nknews.org slash professionals. Hello listeners, welcome back. And this week we have an unscheduled feature interview it's with Chad O'Carroll and Steve Tharp to talk about what happened at the Joint Security Area near Panmunjom yesterday. If you haven't been asleep for the last month, you're probably aware that an American jumped over, ran over the line from south to north. And uh, that's what we're here to talk about. It's, uh, it's a heck of a story. And between the three of us, Chad, Steve and myself, we've all been to the JSA many times. Steve, of course, many more times than Chad and me, but still. Chad, do you want to start? You you uh, broke the story yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I, I I came back to the office around seven p.m. to get some earphones, and my colleagues told me that a uh, U.S. national had crossed the military demarcation line at the Joint Security Area, and uh, so we got to work in doing a sort of late evening uh, story on the matter. Yeah, it's the first case I am aware of of someone running from the south to the north at the JSA. And basically, it looks like a relatively young U.S. soldier who had been briefly detained in South Korea was being repatriated to the United States to serve or to receive some kind of charges for some minor crimes he'd committed in, in South Korea. And the gentleman managed to escape Incheon Airport after checking in. His name, by the way, is Private Travis King. And somehow from the airport, now we don't know the timeline for this, whether it was days, maybe a week or two, uh, he got onto a tour and went to Panmunjom yesterday and took a chance and fled across the border. And that's basically all we know. The North Koreans haven't acknowledged his case yet. This is very unprecedented. COVID, of course, has prevented all foreigners more or less from entering North Korea now for almost four years. So, yeah, there's a, a lot to unpack here, and we'll see how things go. Yeah, Steve, do you want to jump in? What are your comments? First of all, give us the historical yeah, context, is... Steve. Uh, in, in, your, in all your years in Korea, have you ever heard of or witnessed a story of, uh, like this? Not at all, The uh, especially not at the JSA. We know that there were five defectors, American defectors, mm -hmm. in uniform since the Korean armistice was signed and 70 years ago. Right. The uh, last one was those, Joseph we're... White in 1982, I believe. Right. First four were in the uh, early 60s. The people that defected, you know, to include Joe White that being the fifth one in 1982, they were uh, folks like this young man. Uh, they were all in some kind of trouble. That's why you defect. Mm. It's not about ideology or anything like that. It's because you're facing uh, punishment. So the idea that someone would defect in 2023 is just almost unbelievable. Although we did have a case where someone tried to cross the MDL in uh, January of 2001, and the guards grabbed him before he could. But his whole intention was to maybe create a firefight there to draw attention on the problems in North Korea. Right. Yes, so that was. I think it wasn't widely uh, reported at the time, but that was the uh, German doctor Norbert Volovson who had done um, emergency work in North Korea around the time of Secretary of State Madeleine Albright's visit, and he took the media around and showed them the state of orphanages and things, and then came to, to South Korea to be an activist for North Korean human rights. And this activity at the, at the JSA was part of that. Right. Now, uh, and I was, I, I, I was, involved, I was oh. involved in that, my role as the Assistant Secretary of the UNC MAC, and I was on the phone for several hours that night, and uh, we got him out of the JSA, out of Camp Boniface, and turned over to the uh, Korean police at the Grand Unification Bridge. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about the, the timeline of, of what went down yesterday. So BBC is reporting, I don't know if either of you have seen it, but BBC is reporting that he was supposed to leave Korea by plane on Monday, and he was on a JSA tour on Tuesday. Now, in a previous life, I used to work for a, a tour company 
and booked and ran many of these tours. I even led tours for uh, groups of U.S. Marines to the JSA. Now, I know that without special assistance, you could not get a person registered for a commercial tour to the JSA less than 48 hours beforehand. And in fact, when we were there, we even extended that to 72 hours because there were some mistakes or people who were you know, pushed in at the last minute. Now, this tour yesterday that Travis King was on was a commercial tour run by a South Korean tour agency. And if he escaped from whatever situation he was in with a, with a, a custodian or a uh, somebody watching over him, a, a minder at the airport on Monday, there's no way that he could have booked himself into a tour that left Seoul on Tuesday morning to go to the JSA. There's simply no time for that. Would you agree with that, Steve? I don't know. The, uh, you know, you say a Korean tour company, it's actually a, a contractor associated with the uh, USO there at, at Camp Humphreys. And they may have made, been able to make a phone call up in order to fill a seat. Those, that's kind of a lucrative business. And if they could have done that, then that might have been what happened. Okay, um, but however, that would have been irregular, though, if, if he'd left at the right. airport at lunchtime on a Monday and been on the tour the morning of a Tuesday. That, that's not how things right. normally go. And as you point out, it's 48, 72 hours. I right. still abide by that today. So it's possible that he may actually have planned this trip to the JSA before escaping from the airport on Monday. I don't think so, because I think he was probably in uh, correctional custody up to the time when they took him to the airport. Do you think he had some help then? I can't speculate. Yeah. I don't know how you do it without help, but I can't well, speculate that someone was helping him. I'm sure that's, if that happened, that's a criminal investigation that's going on in, in and of itself and is really unrelated to the, uh, yeah. the crossing. Yeah, because it's maybe possible. Isn't on, it maybe possible, Jacko, that he, uh, you know, he might have used his military badge or affiliation to bluff his way onto this tour kind of last minute? As Steve says, that you know that, that there's a lucrative business to this, and if there's seats to fill, and he has a military badge, perhaps it's a little bit easier. Yeah, I'm not sure. no, I, I'm not disputing the the fact that the tour company would have wanted to take that extra seat if there was an empty seat on the bus. That's, uh, I mean, certainly from my experience in the tour world, yeah, absolutely. But because the tour company has to send that lit, the full manifest of all the passengers and their ID numbers up to Unkmac well before the tour, uh, we but, were simply. We were simply getting uh, Unc Max refusal saying, well, you can't put these people on that. There's not enough time. But how many times have you been on the bus when you get to Boniface and someone actually comes on and counts everyone and looks at the ID cards? I've ne that's never happened to me in maybe six trips. Yeah, well, the, the, but these weren't commercial trips, uh, were they? I've been on tours and orientation. Now, this this was described as an orientation at this what this gentleman was on yesterday. And... Yeah, I mean, I know, I know that sometimes they do those inspections, but oftentimes they don't. So maybe they just took a chance. The tour company took a chance and said, look, if you come up here, it's on you. And if you don't get in, then you're just going to have to wait outside. Mm -hmm. At my very own wedding, we, we went to the JSA beforehand. And one of my friends, they forgot to add him to the, the roster. And that is exactly what happened. They said, we'll bring you. And then he ended up having to wait at the gift shop yeah. at the parking lot and wasn't allowed to go further. Yeah. Hey, uh, <laughs> as a point of order, the yes, UNC, Steve. yeah, the, the UNC refers to these as orientation visits, not tours. Mm -hmm. And that's true so of both you, commercial and non-commercial visits, right, Steve? Yeah, every, everything's an orientation. So yeah, if you're not there on work, if you're not there on duty, it's an orientation visit. Is that correct? It's an orientation for everyone, yeah. you know, except for the guys, yeah, working inside there. But right. what we would call a tour is what the UNC calls an orientation. Yeah. So don't okay, get so hung that's... up on that wording. Yeah. All right. That's a, yeah, a good piece of information to bear in mind there. Now, so based on the account that we have that was written up on, uh, on Facebook that you quoted in your story yesterday, Chad, this, they were coming out of the building T2, one of the blue buildings in Conference Row and later on identified as Private Travis King, made a, a loud laugh and then ran for it and, and ran across the military demarcation line to the building on the north side that's known as Panmungak, the, uh, the North Korean building, ran up those stairs and to the closed doors. And then after that, nothing more was seen because the tourists that were remaining were all ushered into uh, Freedom House on the southern side. Yeah, yeah. So presumably, um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not easy to, uh, it's not, not di difficult to imagine that he probably opened the door and went into Panmungak unless it was locked. That's one possibility. 
the other is that you know normally when you get to t2 you go in you some people loiter outside in my experience for photos and whatnot uh, and then you wander over to see the tree planted by kim jong-un and when you're wandering over the south korean i guess soldiers in my experience just a few months ago i think you were there with me they mm -hmm. follow you along yeah it's possible maybe he he somehow escaped their notice and and stayed adjacent to t2 or nearby and then just saw a, a space and ran for it um mm. i you know honestly even with them there if you're a strong runner it, i can easily see how you could get past two of those guys because they would their reaction time would have to be so quick mm. and they would have to jump on jump towards you and grab one of your limbs and there's a lot that can go wrong in just such a short development of of events like that yeah. so so yeah I, I i don't i can see it being relatively easy steve your comments on that how hard or easy would it have been to stop someone who was intent to cross over the line well i think it'd be very difficult because guy probably had some kind of running shoes or at a minimum he was wearing uh street shoes Whereas the soldiers that were providing the security escort are wearing boots and I believe bulletproof vests. So they're, it's going to be a little bulkier for, for them. All mm -hmm. he's got to do is sprint for three seconds and he's across. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and now help me with the understanding here, Steve. Would soldiers from the South trying to stop him, would they pretty much have to stop at the military dem demarcation line or could they go over it and try to drag him back to the South? That's all a matter of what the rules of engagement say. And I have no idea. I was familiar with the old rules of engagement 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but those were classified secret. And so it's not something I could talk about unless I knew that they were cleared. I'm sure that those rules of engagement have had to have changed since the comprehensive military agreement in 2018, right. when the JSA itself was demilitarized. But no idea. But I, I got to believe that the basic premise it still is you don't cross the military demarcation line. OK, so that really gives you a, only a couple of meters at best to try to stop somebody if they're running from just outside T to cross the, the military demarcation line. Right. It's it's like an American football. You only got a few feet to go yep. to the goal line. And so right. if you dart through that hole right away, you go in untouched. Now, since he's crossed over and he's now in, in North Korean custody, although North Koreans haven't said anything about this yet, the K Korean People's Army has made a statement. But technically, Steve, given that we're only in an armistice situation, not a, uh, a full peace, does he count as a prisoner of war? Well, I don't believe so, because it's clear that he did this through his own volition. So to me, he's a deserter or a traitor or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that the lawyers at the United Nations Command have gone through this and are making the fine tuning on his, or his status right now. Right. And what do you imagine could be his, his fate? What would be, um, how would the North Koreans treat him? Well, that's a good question, too. The last guy to defect, as you pointed out, was Joey White in uh, August of 1982. One of my friends had been his platoon leader at the time and said the guy was he was always in trouble. And so when he got to North Korea, he thought, I can just kind of start over. But then I think he got a little depressed on lack of freedom and things like that. And mm. the, uh, he was reported to have died in the Taedong River three years later in August of 85. Now, what about in 1994, when there was that helicopter shot down that accidentally strayed over the uh, military demarcation line and one man was killed and, and Bobby Hall, the pilot, was not? Uh, how was he treated? You know, I think I read that he said he was treated fairly well. That's a different case because the North Koreans knew that we had to come and get him. And so they didn't want to beat him up too much. They remembered the, uh, the bad press they got from the Weblo crew. So I think they treated him decently, knowing that they were going to get some kind of political reward from uh, the Clinton administration to get him back. Hmm. On, on this one, the, a key difference, I think, is number one, zooming out, Kim Yo-jong has made it clear just two, three days ago, she issued a very, very long statement, basically underlining in extreme detail why North Korea has zero interest in talks with the United States right now. So I think the idea of them using him as some kind of currency for negotiations is very unlikely. 
Secondly, I mean, he's very young, 20, 22, 23, junior position. He's been detained already in uh, for, for several weeks. How much intelligence value is he going to have? Yes, he'll be able to talk maybe somewhat about movement, security procedures, logistics, names of individuals. Beyond that, you know, he's kind of not really a very high priority figure. I think the other thing is we've got to consider COVID. Now, North Korea has been mm. very, very fearful of its own personnel coming anywhere near the uh, MDL in the JSA for some months now. In fact, when Jacko and I was there in March, we didn't see any North Korean personnel whatsoever. And I understand that's still the case. So it's quite likely there could be some kind of quarantine process that is the first and foremost effort on the North Korean side. But my suspicion is, is there's not going to be a strong rationale for North Korea to keep this guy very long. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think a lot has changed since the, the cases of the Cold War era. And especially the biggest change is that North Korea is just really in a super isolationist mo mode right now and rejecting all, all forms of talks with the US and even the military uh, communications lines from South Korea to North Korea have been unanswered now for months. Now, they, they have um, in past times sent away some people who they felt were not valuable or who had, you know, something mm -hmm. um, wrong with them. There was a Texan man who talked, you know, he, he uh, crossed into North Korea, did a press conference where he talked about UFOs and very quickly and without any fanfare, he was handed back, as I recall, or given to the Chinese or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there was during the Trump presidency, a, a U.S. national who was returned within just two days. There's the guy, Miles, who you interviewed on this podcast some, right. some years ago, who swam illegally swam across the border, was returned in a few months. Yeah. That probably could have been quicker. He had visa issues actually getting into it, China. So that's right. from the civilian perspective recently, I think the, there's been quite a few examples of them just not wanting to have, for want of a better word, crazy people who have come to North Korea for political or ideological or religious reasons and they just don't want the stress and you know process them and send them back i figure we may see something like that but that you know maybe not we'll see yeah it was definitely uh, in in the realm of speculation here and of course we don't want to, we don't have any idea about uh, mr king's uh, mental state but it's a highly unusual decision when uh, faced with uh, disciplinary measures and sent back to America to uh, escape the airport and come you know, come back to Seoul and basically join a JSA tour the next day. That's a very, very unusual approach. Yeah, um, assuming that, oh, that timeline is correct. Well, we, we yeah, all, I can go on just the BBC reporting that they've said that Monday was when he slipped his uh, guard at the airport, his escort at the airport, and Tuesday was when the tour took place. So at this stage, that's what we've got to go on. Yeah, I, I reached out to the tour company today to ask them questions, and they said that they're not giving any comment to talk to UNC. Mm. So, yeah, because it does raise questions if they did process him so quickly, maybe they did do something wrong. I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah. Now, the other context we, we have we should bring into this is that there was a visit by a, a U.S. nuclear sub to Korea that made uh, North Korea get a bit threatening this week and and then also North Korea launched a couple of missiles last night Chad could you bring that in yeah certainly so zooming out we have the USS Kentucky uh, docked yesterday in Busan it's a submarine with nuclear capable missiles or at least it can hold nuclear capable missiles a trident and this is the first time we've seen a rotation of a submarine like this in around 40 years the Kim Yo Jong statement from a couple of days ago was very angry about the state of US rock relations uh, and sorry, US DPRK relations and did draw attention to this. She, in fact, said, which we found quite interesting in the office, that from North Korea's perspective, tensions are worse than during 2017 uh, mm. when the so called fire and fury was playing out. And of course, we saw last night in the early hours North Korea firing off two short range missiles and what you can see from the range of those missiles it was around 500 kilometers if memory serves but someone my colleague colin has looked at the radius of those and that the striking distance is almost exactly where the uss kentucky is if you but just a, a different part of the sea mm. so they're clearly trying to send a message there was an icbm launch just a few days ago and that followed very vigorous detailed and robust complaints from north korea about U.S. reconnaissance assets intruding 
airspace above its exclusive economic zone to the east of the peninsula. So there's been lots of stuff building up and it almost does look like Kim Yo Jong's trying to build a paper trail right now that could be cited after some kind of confrontation or escalation. Uh, there's so many warnings. I mean, last week, three warnings from her in 24 hours. It's really, really quite something. So yeah, I, I think we should be braced for, for something. And with this kind of incident taking place on a canvas, like I've just described, uh, yeah, the North Koreans are probably going to want to very robustly interview this man and find out what his true intentions are and also make sure that he is as junior as is being stated in open source media. Mm. Steve, given uh, what uh, Chad just described there, could you put this in the context of your uh, famous uh, eight-step do loop of, uh, <laughs> of where North Korea-US relations are? First of all, <laughs> are you concerned about possible North Korean retaliation for a visit by the sub or something like that? No, I'm not. You know, in terms of physical kinetic action against the South or against our forces, if that's what you mean, no. Sounds like they've already responded with their missile launch. And they may have been planned already. Right. Hmm. I I think the defector has, you know, of course, nothing to do with any of this. But yeah, I do uh, still think that eight step do loop is in effect and the North Koreans are continuing to raise tension. Okay, just briefly go over that that loop again. And and how does it work? And where where do you think we are at right now? Well, I think we're at at step one. Step two is agree to a a breakthrough, you know, and then some other intermediate steps and then start stalling it out until you get to the point where you say, ah, everything's done. You know, uh, that agreement's null and valid and you go back to the uh, the tension thing again. Mm hmm. So we seem to be in that tension loop right now. I'd just say as well, I I think Steve is spot on that we won't see any confrontation, kinetic confrontation, at least while the submarine is in town, which has presumably a lot of support, supporting air cover with it. I feel that when you look at US ROC exercises in recent years under Kim Jong-un, the North Koreans tend to publicize their follow-up moves after the main period of exercise is complete, when maybe some of the visiting US military assets and personnel are off pen and less ready to rapidly respond. So, you know, we've got a small window coming up just before summertime exercises start on the US and rock side following this submarine. We we don't yet know the dates for the the summer drills, but presumably they'll be mid-August or something like that. So We're now July 19th. There's certainly time for the North Koreans to do something. And just to remind you, listeners, again, like last year was the first set of major size US ROC exercises in summer since the Trump administration. And there was that pause that Trump agreed to at Singapore. And that resulted in North Korea doing lots of very wild sets of missile, operational missile launch exercises, eight missiles in one day, 23 in another day drones in December. So yeah, I'd be worried about what the North Koreans may have planned. It hopefully won't lead to some minor form of confrontation and just be demonstrations of missile power, etc. But we'll see what happens. But Steve, to come back to you and your eight step loop, you normally would say that North Korea, when it engages in, in ratcheting up the tensions, it wants to achieve something like getting a concession or, you know, uh, getting something. What do you think, given that North Korea has signaled that it doesn't want to talk to America right now and it doesn't want to talk to South Korea, what do you think it would try to get out of increasing tensions right now? Well, it's just part of the normal thing. you got to look at what, what month this is. Yeah, From right. uh, the 25th of June to the 27th of July is the anti-U.S. month in North Korea in terms of propaganda. You know, those dates being the start of the Korean War and the signing of the armistice. Mm-hmm. So... Traditionally, this has been a period where there is more rhetoric against the United States. There, I don't know that there's necessarily uh, a lot of missile firings and things, but that's something to be expected this month, you know, if you look back historically. Mm-hmm. Then certainly, uh, Travis King picked a, uh, an awkward time to go to North Korea during this uh, anti-U.S. hate month. <laughs> that is a good point. Now, and, and uh, while I don't disagree with Chad that they might just send him back. Maybe they might find a way to use him as a 
a good piece of propaganda. You think like in a, a giving, make him give a speech or appear in a, mo a movie or something? Well, you know, maybe the movies are uh, not the thing anymore. You know, movies were big under uh, Kim Jong-il. Hmm. And so they needed these foreign devils to play the foreign devils in the, the movies. Yeah. But, you know, maybe someone giving speeches on how evil the, uh, the U.S. system is. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm certainly, I, I wouldn't want to be and, in these shoes right now. Yeah, the, uh, sometimes you make bad decisions that you never recover from. Yes, and, and just to, uh, to sort of wrap it all up with a, a, a bit of a bow there, we have the end of the uh, anti-American hate months coming up. You know, today's we're recording this on Wednesday, the 19th of July, and next week, Thursday, the 27th of July, is the 70th anniversary of the signing of the Korean War armistice, also what North Korea calls the Victory Day or Victory in the Great Fatherland War of Liberation Day. Chad, we're expecting some sort of a, uh, a military parade, aren't we? Yeah, military parade, if it's not rained out, which is always a possibility on the peninsula mm. in July. I mean, this will be, what, the fifth or sixth parade of the COVID era? I really feel like they've milked the parades too much, and yeah. the last few haven't really got much attention, to be honest. But, you know, it is the 70th anniversary of what they claim the victory of the Fatherland uh, Liberation War. So, yeah, um, maybe some new equipment will be rolled out, some missile tests. I continue to be anxious about the prob the growing possibility of risks, miscalculations, accidents. Today is another good example of something that can be unplanned that throws a wrench into things. Right. And uh, you just have to imagine. Imagine a situation like yesterday taking place when tensions are a lot higher after a drone incursion or something mm. along those lines. It's things like this that can potentially add serious risk to, to and inter relations. That's a, a good point. And it, I'll bring it back to Steve there, because Steve, you were saying that you are not worried and, and you know that these things tend, you know, you've been here on the peninsula for on and off for over 40 years. So you've seen lots of this cycle of uh, ratcheting up the tensions and then having some talks, getting a concession, easing the tensions. But are you concerned about the risk of miscalculation or a mistake or a, a wild card being thrown in like we saw yesterday that could uh, throw the, the cycle askew? I don't see that the defection yesterday is having any impact on anything. I don't know. No, no, I just, I just mean as an example of an yeah. unplanned a, a thing that could happen, an externality that could come in to, uh, to knock things for six, as it were. There's always that opportunity, but for some reason, um, we never go to war. And I think part of that's because the North Korean leadership knows a war will mean their extermination by our weapons, weapon systems that are able to focus on uh, North Korea. You know, we have one submarine in a port right now, but we have many submarines that are out uh, just lurking around in the ocean. They're the really dangerous ones. It's not the one that's in port that everybody can see, it's mm -hmm. the others. And between the Los Angeles class and Ohio class submarines, there's a lot of firepower out there that can wreak immediate havoc and destruction on on north korea if they do start a war oh, we certainly I, hope they it don't doesn't want, come to that yeah and, and they don't want that and, uh, they don't want to uh, lose their lives they're just trying to leverage the tension in order to to remain in power hmm. i'm okay. of that school chad final thoughts yeah like i said my prediction is this will be a case of weeks maybe months and he'll be, maybe even days, he'll be sent back. I, I don't think that he's going to be of much propaganda value if it is true that he is on the run and is as junior as has been stated uh, in the public open source. Yes, well, we'll certainly uh, be following that. Uh, listeners, stay tuned to nknews.org uh, for updates. And thank you both, uh, Chad Carol and Steve Tharp, for coming on this podcast today. Thanks thank for having us. Let me ask you this. You're listening to the NK News podcast, so you know more about North Korea than most. But how about the South? To really understand what's happening on the peninsula, you need to know about South Korea. And now you can, through our new Korea Pro news and analysis service. This is not your average news service. It's a thoroughly researched analysis of South Korea's politics, society, and economy from an international perspective. But you know what the cherry on top is? the absolute lack of commercial influences. 
No ads, no sponsored articles. It's just pure, objective analysis by a team of qualified specialists. And the best part? As a listener of this podcast, you get a 25% discount. All you have to do is use the coupon code PODCAST during your sign-up. So head over to careerpro.org slash podcast and start your journey with CareerPro. That's careerpro.org slash podcast. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you already have an NK News subscription, take a look at our NK Pro platform, which offers unparalleled services specifically catered to the needs of professionals who monitor developments on the Korean Peninsula. Inquire about access at membership at nknews.org today. And don't forget, if you have feedback, questions, or guest recommendations, please send them to us at podcast at nknews.org. Our thanks, as always, to Arius Dare and Brian Betts for facilitating this podcast and to Gabby Magnuson, our post-recording producer genius. Thanks for listening and listening again next time. <laughs>